Good afternoon and welcome to Yale Divinity School, virtually at least. My name is Andrew McGowan. I'm Dean of the Berkeley Divinity School at Yale and Professor of Anglican Studies here. It's our great pleasure to welcome the Most Reverend Michael Curry as our speaker this afternoon. Michael Curry barely needs introduction as one of America's most prominent Christian leaders, but of course we're particularly proud of the fact that he's an alumnus of Yale Divinity School. After graduating from here in 1978, Michael Curry ministered in the Episcopal Church in uh, Ohio, Maryland, and North Carolina, uh, having been elected Bishop of North Carolina and then as presiding Bishop of the Episcopal Church in 2015, he's exercised his ministry on a, a larger stage. He's well known as uh, a man of prayer, as a pastor, as an advocate of social justice, and of course, above all, as an inspiring preacher. He's also the author of a number of books, including very recently, Love is the Way, Holding on to Hope in Troubling Times, and the title of our lecture today echoes that recent publication. We're delighted to have him with us here, and I invite you, as it were, virtually also to welcome him as he speaks to us today. Michael Curry. It's a real joy and privilege to be able to be with you for this service of worship on this, the annual convocation of Yale Divinity School. It's also a particular um, privilege, if you will, to be able to participate in this service of worship during this, the 50th year of the affiliation of Yale Divinity School and the Berkeley Divinity School. It's a privilege and a blessing as an alumni of these great divinity schools to be able to say thank you. Thank you for the way you formed me and have formed so many others to witness to the way of Jesus of Nazareth and his love in this world. Thank you. Now in the name of our loving, liberating and life-giving God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ because I believe that, that he has shown us the way to live, to live as God dreams and intends for the human family and for all creation. I'm a follower of Jesus of Nazareth. To put it simply, he has shown us the way to be right and reconciled with the God who is the creator of us all. And the way to be right and reconciled with each other as brothers, sisters, siblings, as the children of God. He's shown us the way to live. To put it bluntly, I'm a follower of Jesus of Nazareth because I believe Jesus was and is right. That love is the way. In fact, I would submit the only way. Jesus was right. Let me offer a text. You know it well, it comes from the 10th chapter of Luke's gospel. It's the story of Jesus in conversation with a lawyer that leads to a discussion of love. And Jesus then tells the parable of the Good Samaritan after their conversation. The lawyer stood up, stood up to test Jesus, saying, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You've given the right answer. Do this and you will live. When that lawyer came up to Jesus and asked him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The te text suggests that this was probably not an innocent question. It was probably the early seeds of a test or challenge to Jesus. But the way the question is framed was and is nonetheless a probing question for us, which is why Luke, I think, tells that story. What must I do to inherit eternal life? 
What must I do to discover a life now that actually means something and matters and a life that is so significant in the eyes of God and in such a relationship with God and, and others that, that it is a life that is not only for now, but a life in eternity. What must I do to inherit eternal life now and not yet? What must I do, if I may put it this way, to understand the secret, the key of life? I remember when I was a boy um, growing up and would go to family funerals. I grew up in the Episcopal side of, uh, of our family, and, uh, but most of our family were, um, were Baptists uh, with a few Pentecostal holiness. And, and I remember there used to be a family joke that um, de depending on which uh, Christian branch of the family was being buried um, or funeralized, um, we would know how long it would be before we came back to the church for the repast, that if it was um, the, the Baptist side of the family, it was going to be a, a little while. Um, if it was the Pentecostal side of the family, uh, you were going to be at church and out at cemetery a long time before. But if it was the Episcopal side, it would be pretty quick and you would get to the family repast pretty quickly. But what I do remember with some of the funerals, and I heard this sermon at least twice and maybe more, an old oral tradition that was passed among black preachers. You don't hear it much anymore, but once upon a time you did. The old preacher would get up in the pulpit and would say, you know, sometimes when you go to the cemetery and you look around and you see the headstones and you see the name of the person who has died on the headstone and you may see rest in peace or beloved father, mother, sister, brother. And then underneath all of that, you would see the date and year of the person's birth, a little dash and the date and the year of the person's death. And the old preacher would say, you know, John Doe or Jane Doe didn't have much to do with the date of their birth. In fact, they had nothing to do with it. They had no control over it. Very little impact. And the truth is they probably had very little control or impact over the date and year of their death. What they did have influence and some control, not total, but some control over what did they do with that little dash in between. The question in life is what did you do with your dash? And that lawyer, whether he meant it sincerely or not, was asking Jesus, what must I do with my dash to have a life that matters, a life of meaning, a life so saturated by eternity and eternal love that not even the titanic powers of death can take away from me. What did you do with your dash? Jesus came back and said, well, what did Moses say? What did Moses say in the, in the law, in, uh, in the Torah, in the teaching? And the lawyer, being a good lawyer, knew what was in the law. He knew Deuteronomy. He knew Leviticus. He knew the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Um, and he knew that Leviticus said, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love God and love your neighbor. Jesus said, you have answered correctly. Love God. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do that and you will live. Love God. Love your neighbor. Love yourself. Therein is the secret of life. But the lawyer came back and said, well, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. I agree with you. you. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. I'm with you on that, Jesus. But could we more narrowly define neighbor? Because I'm a lawyer and words matter. In other words, can we define neighbor so that neighbor represents those who are like me? Neighbor is those who I agree with. Neighbor, those in my political party. Neighbor, those who share my religion. Neighbor, those who share my race. Neighbor, those who are members of my nation. Neighbor, neighbor those who are on my side, those who are like me think like me, live like me, act like me. Neighbor is not other. 
Can we narrowly define neighbor? And that's when Jesus tells the parable of the good Samaritan, of somebody who helps somebody else. As the old song say, if I can help somebody along the way, then my living shall not be in vain. Uh, somebody who helps somebody else in spite of the fact that they were other in terms of the world to each other. Um, he helped that other person be, not because he was other, but because he was brother, because he was a human child of God, as Genesis 1 says, created in the image and likeness of God, a, a, a human being, a child of God, your brother, your sister, your sibling, just because. No, no. Jesus was telling us the secret of life for us individually and in family and in community, for us as a nation, for us as a world. Do not relegate the teachings of Jesus and the values that are derived thereby only to interpersonal relationships. They are meant for our political arrangements, our economic policies, in our global realities. Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor. And while you're at it, love yourself. Jesus was right. Back in, um, in, in 2016, in the last presidential election, and we are in the midst of a presidential election in a time of COVID-19 when many are suffering sickness, hardship, and death, when the poor are inflicted and affected even more than the rest of us, but everyone is infected, affected. We gather even in a time when the racial realities have risen up and been revealed, they've always been here. We realized and saw them when that little girl filmed George Floyd, breathing his last, like Jesus on the cross, it is finished. We saw it when Breonna Taylor, whole life in front of her, innocent, gunned down. We've seen the horror of and reality of racism, of white supremacy, of supremacy of anybody over anybody else. We've seen the abyss. And we are electing a president and other office holders in a time when this nation is, as Abe Lincoln said before, the Civil War, a house divided. Several years ago in the last presidential election, you may remember that there were protesters who assembled whenever Hillary Clinton had a rally or whenever Donald Trump had a rally. In one of the rallies not far from here in North Carolina, a Trump rally in Fayetteville, uh, protesters protested at the rally and it got to the point where law enforcement was called in to escort them out. As they were be the protesters were being escorted out, a man named John McGraw, 79 years old, a white man, jumped over the sheriffs and punched a black man named Raheem Jones, punched him in the face. McGraw was uh, arrested and, um, and eventually charged and tried. But at the time of his arrest, the uh, North Carolina newspaper quoted him as saying, and, and I quote, he deserved it. The next time we see him, we may have to kill him. We don't know who he is. He might be a member of a terrorist organization. We don't know who he is. McGraw was eventually charged with assault, arrested, found guilty. He pleaded no contest, apologized, and was sentenced to 12 months probation. After the court hearing and after the sentencing, 
uh, both McGraw and Jones were both in the courtroom and they met each other and faced each other. McGraw said this, if I met you in the street, the same thing would have occurred. I would have said, go home. One of us is going to get hurt. That's what I would have said. But we are caught up in a political mess today, you and me. And we got to heal our country. We are caught up in a political mess together, you and me. And we've got to heal our country. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice? Yes, justice must be done. To love mercy. Remember mercy and compassion. And to walk humbly with our God. We've got to heal our country. Wrongs must be righted. Truths must be faced. But the way of healing and the way of reconciliation that leads to beloved community must be followed. I am mindful of the wisdom, the old Negro spiritual sung by slaves long ago, who said, who spoke of the healing power of God, the power of God to, to heal injustice, to right wrongs, and yet to heal the broken, to heal the wounded. They sang a spiritual in answer to old Jeremiah, who cried out, is there no bomb in Gilead? And they sang back across the centuries, across the ocean, across the continents. Jeremiah, oh, there is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a bomb in Gilead to heal the sin sick soul. And if you look at their verses, you, you find out what that healing bomb was and is. They, they, they said, oh, sometimes I feel discouraged and think my life's in vain, but then, the Holy Spirit revives my soul again. Oh, there is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a bomb in Gilead to heal the sin sick soul. But then they went on and said, if you cannot preach like Peter and you cannot pray like Paul, you just tell the love of Jesus. How he died to save us all. He didn't die for himself, died for others, a way of love that is unselfish, sacrificial, that actually seeks the good and the welfare and the well-being of others, that overflowing love, that way of love lived by us, proclaimed by us. That is the way to the healing waters where healing waters doth flow. Oh, there is a bomb in Gilead. Healed. The sin sick so let me bring this this to a conclusion i'm taping this just a week after uh the death and the burial of the late supreme court justice ruth bader ginsburg and i was struck by all the wonderful things that were said about her this was a sister who embodied the way of love, unselfish, sacrificial, seeking the good and the welfare and the well-being of others. She embodied that way of love in the public sphere, if you will. She embodied by standing up for the, the rights of, of, of women um, before that was safe, popular, or fashionable to do. She embodied that by standing up for the rights of everybody. As everybody, she stood up for the realization of, of the Declaration of Independence that those ideals um, not fully lived into and sometimes hypocritically opposed, but those ideals we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. She worked to make those ideals real for all of us. Four score and seven years ago, our forefathers brought upon this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Ruth, Gator, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg worked to make the words of old Abe Lincoln in that Gettysburg address true for all of us now. And we are better because of her. 
but there was something else. She not only saw wrongs and righted them. She not only stood up for justice. She was a person of real human friendship and relationship. One of her best friends, Anton Scalia, the late Justice Anton Scalia. They were close friends. They didn't agree. They represented different sides of the aisle of jurisprudence and judicial philosophy. And yet they were close friends. In the documentary film, Notorious RBG, where they kind of cribbed off of Notorious B.I.G. I never thought only in America could Notorious B.I.G. and no Notorious R.B.G. somehow be associated together. But in the documentary, which is really a wonderful, a wonderful film, um, they asked her, the, the reporter asked her, why this friendship with Justice Scalia? You, you, you don't agree on a lot. And she said, well, we do actually agree on a lot, but there's other things we don't agree on. She said, but, well, we both love opera. And that's the word she used. We both love opera. And so they and their spouses would go to operas together. And then she said, and we, we both love to travel. Our, our spouses and we, we all love to travel. And so we went and traveled together. And then she said, but maybe most importantly, we both love the Constitution of the United States. We, the people of the United States of America, in order to form a more perfect union, we love that Constitution and the ideals for which it stands. That shared love created common ground where even difference could be contained and relationship maintained by common love. We are in a political fix. We got some tough times ahead. But Jesus has shown us the way. And the way of love is that way. As Dr. King said a long time ago, the history of humanity is replete with the bleached bones of civilizations that have refused to listen to him when he said, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. As you did it to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you have done it unto me. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. God love you. God bless you. And may God hold, hold us all, and this whole creation, in those almighty hands of love.